Welcome to the University of Melbourne. My name is Simon Evans. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor International of the University and a professor in the Melbourne Law School. So I say it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you to the university, and in doing so, I uh, do, as we do on all formal university occasions, acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present. This evening, we meet here to inaugurate a new lecture series, the University of Melbourne London School of Economics lecture series, the first being delivered here in Melbourne, and later this year, a return leg uh, in London. And hopefully, this is going to become an annual um, or a biannual fixture uh, in our public thought leadership uh, uh, events. The London School of Economics is one of the foremost social science universities in the world. It's a specialist university established in 1895 by Beatrice and Sidney Webb. It has an outstanding reputation for academic excellence. It was set up to understand the causes of things and has a, um, a long-standing emphasis on engaging with the wider world uh, to communicate and shape its social science research. The University of Melbourne is 160 years old this year. It's a global research university renowned for teaching and research across a comprehensive range of disciplines. They're different in age, in size, in geographical location, but share two or three fundamental commitments. Both are very international in their outlook. Both are committed to research excellence, and both are committed to engaging with their publics, local, and global. The lecture series is therefore uh, very fitting as an expression of those shared uh, ambitions and achievements in uh, research and public communication of the results of research. A further point of affinity is the shared commitment to understanding uh, the wider world and uh, responding to changes in that world, in particular the changes we see in Asia. The University of Melbourne, in particular, uh, aims to achieve uh, significant depth and breadth of engagement in the Asian region uh, as we observe and connect with uh, a, a process of modernisation that is occurring at unprecedented scale and pace, a phenomenon that shapes research agendas right across the university. It's therefore fitting that the inaugural lecture in this series touches on those very themes. So uh, can I conclude my welcome with, with that? Uh, in a moment, I'll, I'll call on Helen Sullivan to introduce this evening's speakers. But first, uh, two mundane matters um, need to intrude. First, uh, can I ask you to turn your phones off? Uh, and second, can I um, observe, if you haven't already, that there are two cameras at the back and they are on. Uh, we're being recorded this evening uh, for later broadcast on the ABC's Big Ideas program uh, and also for podcast. So please note um, both of those things. And can I call on uh, Professor Helen Sullivan who is Director of the Melbourne School of Government in the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Simon, um, and good evening, everyone. Uh, the School of Government is delighted to co-host this inaugural University of Melbourne London School of Economics lecture, and it is my very great pleasure as the MSOG Director to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Michael Cox. The Melbourne School of Government was itself inaugurated very recently, just last month in fact. And for those of you who have not either read about us in the press, nor witnessed our shameless self-promotion in a variety of media, including a spectacular billboard at Canberra Airport that came to the attention of at least one individual, here's the key information. The Melbourne School of Government is a new whole of university venture hosted by the Faculty of Arts that aims to improve the quality of public policy making and governance nationally, regionally and internationally. The school is a collaboration between the Faculty of Arts, Law and Business and Economics 
and aims to bring to bear the combined disciplinary expertise and resources of those faculties to improve the capacity of decision makers to make wise decisions, to build and design sound public institutions, and to improve societal outcomes. We will do this through a combination of graduate teaching and executive education, research and engagement, including public lectures like this one. Our ambition, as you might imagine, is to be among the best schools of government in the world. And deepening our relationships with institutions like the London School of Economics and with academics like Professor Michael Cox is essential to our goal. The establishment of the Melbourne School of Government was prompted partly by some of the issues that Professor Cox will address in his lecture this evening, Australia and the West in a new Asian order. The language of the Asian century is almost ubiquitous in a certain kind of public discourse in Australia. The government was among the first to provide a, a white paper on the Asian century and also to support financially the development of what it's now calling Asia capability amongst bureaucrats and businesses. This focus is as a result of changes in the world economy, the oft-cited shift from the global north to the south, from the west to the east, or more specifically to India and to China. And so it is both timely and appropriate that Professor Cox offers us an alternative way of thinking about what's going on, a challenge to the new normal, if you like, that we are all more or less complicit in, and some suggestion that in the arena of power, change may not be as significant as the things that are, have stayed the same. Professor Cox is ideally suited to deliver this lecture. He is a chair in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics and has a, a long and distinguished career uh, in politics and, and international affairs. In 2004, he helped establish the Cold War Studies Centre and in 2008, Ideas, an internationally renowned foreign policy think tank based at the LSE. Professor Cox is one of those academics that we at the University of Melbourne are seeking to encourage, facilitate and grow through the School of Government. He is a rigorous and internationally regarded academic, the author of numerous books, including the most recent, his 2013 publication of US foreign policy and democracy promotion. But he is also somebody who extensively engages with policymakers and seeks to influence and improve their ability to make good and wise decisions. He is, as you will all know, this is partly why you're here, a very well-known and sought-after speaker on global affairs in the United States, in Australia, in Asia, and in the U EU. And most recently, he has turned his attention to the lecture, the subject of the lecture that he will be delivering this evening, the rise of Asia and whether, in fact, the world is or is not undergoing a major sh power shift. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Michael Cox. Thank you for those uh, very, very kind uh, words. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to the, to the University of Melbourne for inviting me. Um, that's very kind. I'd also like to thank all those who've made this possible here this evening. I've noticed, by the way, the University of Melbourne keeps stealing people from around the world. Uh, and you stole one of our best and brightest, the sitting there in the front row, my good friend, colleague from the LSE, and still good friend and colleague here at the University of Melbourne, Andrew Walter. We can't get you back, I think, Andrew, now, so that's it. Um, and I hope also, following from what was first said, this will be the beginning of something important between the London School of Economics and the uh, University of Melbourne. I should also, by the way, quickly add the London School of Economics and Political Science. So just a minor correction, but just in case you think the place is run by economists. Once economists start running places, you're in trouble. I'd also like, finally, to thank all the great students I've met here this week. I started teaching uh, last, uh, last Saturday, just off the plane. And I had a great time with the students. I hope they had a great time with me. We then did a, I hope, a, a, well, I thought it was a great uh, book launch with Tim Lynch, uh, an, another exile or another emigre. Um, and I met some great students. So I, I really also like to thank and extend thanks to all the great students I've met here. I think it's very easy in institutions, higher education, to get so sucked into research that you forget what universities are for. And in the end, what they're fundamentally for is the communication of knowledge to a new generation of students. And so I've really enjoyed meeting the students here, and uh, I hope I can continue that relationship. Uh, I also have to extend an apology uh, for interfering into the internal affairs of another sovereign state. 
uh, namely your own, uh, Australia. But you know, that's an English habit. Uh, <laughs> um, and with that apology in mind, I just want to reflect uh, on recent discussions here in Australia uh, about America, America's, or sorry, Australia's position in the world. There's a Freudian slip. Three core documents, three core documents have emerged from the bowels of different bureaucracies uh, over the last uh, few months. One from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in late 2012. A second, probably much less read, I think, uh, which was the first national security strategy paper called, interestingly, Strong and Secure, uh, which appeared in January 2013 of this year. And then the Defense White Paper of, of May 2013. Much of the focus has been on the first one, although I think all three probably have to be read together um, in order to get a comprehensive view of where Australia now sees itself in the world, and particularly sees itself in relationship to the region in which it happens to be geographically located. Reading through those documents, and I'm a great believer that you should read official documents, you kind of see the pain that has gone into writing documents. You wonder who wrote that sentence, how that was deleted, should that semicolon be there? Um, having not participated in these things myself, but having listened to many others who have, you could see there was a lot of redrafting that went on in all three documents. I really do feel sorry for those who had to do it, but I do congratulate them nonetheless for having persisted. The, uh, the document coming out of DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, last October, is largely, almost entirely, uh, about economics. Uh, it's, to say it was treasury driven, I think, would probably be an understatement. Um, and of course, it focuses very much on the economic opportunities and the implications of the economic changes taking place in this part of the world and the opportunities and challenges this presents for Australia, with a number of important and necessary uh, policy changes in, within Australia itself on language policies and a whole bunch of other things as well. The other two documents, the National Security Strategy document and the Defence White Paper, have a kind of slightly harder edge. Uh, this is what you wouldn't expect anything else from soldiers and from people in the national security uh, apparatus, namely that this is what you should talk about. You don't want to talk about the nice stuff, you want to talk about the bad things. You don't want to talk about the opportunities, you love the threats. Can you imagine a Department of Defence without a reasonable threat? Um, so it's got a kind of different tone. Uh, it has a, deals with different issues and in some senses deals with what you might call different problems. Although in the end, and this is my major point, the, there is a common assumption that runs through each of the three documents. Even if the language is different, they come out of a different way of thinking, maybe a different, uh, a different bureaucratic style with different audiences in mind, Nonetheless, I think they are united by at least one common assumption or assumptions. And that is, as, as was I think already hinted at in the, in the introductions, that there's rapid economic change which is moving uh, the world more generally and moving the international system more generally. There's a rebalancing, to use a phrase out of one of the documents, a rebalancing of global power. Um, that phrase comes back time and time again and is repeated in one form or another throughout each of the three documents. You could say that's the central motif. In acceptance, there's a rebalancing of global power. Moreover, and to add to that, this movement or this rebalancing is largely one way from west, not clearly defined sometimes, to the east, which we think we know what it means. But again, to quote something from one of the documents, an ongoing strategic, economic, and military shift is taking place towards Asia Pacific and towards Asia more generally. To add to this, this movement is likely to continue into the near, indeed, the distant future. There's some vagaries on that. Some say, well, pr predicting anything is, is, is a mug's game. Uh, you don't know, things can come along. Events, dear boy, events can upset the best laid plans of mice and men, but nonetheless, 
There is an underlying assumption, too, that even though there may be some bumps along the road and some difficulties along the road, this process, this movement towards the east, away from the west, this rebalancing of global power is almost, to quote a previous prime minister of this country, unstoppable. And the result of all this, of course, is the emergence of a new century. And indeed, to go back to the original title of the DFAT document, it is Australia in an Asian century. And the 21st century, the rest of this, would be effectively shaped increasingly. And Australia's role within this world would be shaped by not just Asia itself, but the fact that the future would be Asia. So it's also making a prediction. There's also an implicit assumption, not just about where we were or where we are, but where we will be and where Australia will be. In other words, Australia is locking itself into the future, where the future will be in this new, in this new century. Now, again, I followed, tried to follow some of the debates in the Australian press and on the website ever since it was published, particularly in relationship to the DFAT document. And of course, there's been some debate and there's been quite a lot of criticism, uh, particularly of, 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 of some aspects of, the, of this document. Uh, none more articulate, it seems to me, than that articulated and put forward by Hugh White, somebody I know and whose work uh, I, I respect. Now, Hugh's general critique of the, of the document, of course, was essentially that it avoided asking hard questions, um, that it was far too optimistic, and that it discounted risk. In other words, the government at least had been naive about the risks and dangers ahead, particularly in relationship to the rise of China, the political and strategic implications thereof, the implications of that in turn for the China-US relationship, and what this would in turn mean for Australia's relationship with both its most e economically important partner, namely China, and its most important security guarantor, namely the United States. And of course, from that, Hugh put forward the controversial notion of the idea of a concert of Asia, in which the United States should effectively cede equality to China, China should participate with the United States in a new great power condominium, effectively, which would, uh, which would shape the future of Asia. Now, I know that this particular idea didn't go down terribly well uh, amongst many people, and it certainly didn't go down terribly well in Washington. I can certainly assure you of that, and I'm sure he knows it better than anybody. So there was a debate generated, particularly by the DFAT document. But even Hugh himself, and this is what I found quite interesting, didn't challenge the underlying assumption, didn't challenge the underlying assumption that something called a power shift was taking place. Indeed, it's precisely because a power shift is taking place that he is so worried. That's the whole point. If you go back to good old IR theory, we know that the greatest danger at any moment in time in history, going back to the rise of France in the late 18th century, the rise of Germany in the 19th and 20th, the rise of Japan, even the rise of the USSR, by the mid-20th century, the greatest danger, the great, greatest moment of trans, is that moment of transition when there is a power shift. So even a critic as, 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 as articulate, as intelligent as Hugh White, still accepts that a power shift is underway, that something fundamental is taking place. In other words, agrees with what I would call the core assumptions of that document, indeed, the, the other two. Now, in articulating this analysis of what one might call an irreversible power shift, the government here in, uh, in Canberra um, is only reflecting what I think has become over the last 10 years uh, a wider international consensus about the newly emerging world order. If you like, the notion of power shift since 2001 has become the paradigm of choice. Uh, amongst many, many different kinds of people coming at this from different angles. But I do think what, what Australia is saying in its new documents reflects a consensus which has already been achieved uh, elsewhere in, in, in various debates. This consensus, looking for the origins of anything, of course, is always highly problematic. Um, but dare I say that if one's looking for the origins of this new consensus, this new paradigm of choice, I think it begins in November 2001, 
Who begins it? Jim O'Neill. Which organization? A government? No, Goldman Sachs. The notion of the BRICS. Total invention, nobody had ever come up with before. Become the most important acronym of the last 10 years, even though some people may think it doesn't contain a lot of coherent thought about it. Doesn't matter. Because what Jim O'Neill said in that document, and what others subsequently said coming out of Goldman Sachs, was that the world economy is going to shift. It isn't going to remain a Western economically dominated world. New big economies, Brazil, Russia to some degree, but more obviously India and most obviously China, will reshape the world economy over the next 10, 15, 20 and 30 years. And Jim O'Neill not being exactly somebody who wants to hide his light under a bushel, and Goldman Sachs not exactly an investment bank that has been hiding its uh, light under any bushels over the last, last decade, went on to add further empirical evidence to this. Indeed, what I said to my students the other day, the, the two most famous graphs in history, I think, are those which have come out of Goldman Sachs, which shows the world economy in 2007 with the United States number one, the EU big five at number two, and all the rest kind of trailing behind. You then project forward to 2030, to 2050, China becomes the number one economy, India somewhere close to number three, and a lot of other emerging economies, both in Asia and outside of it, way ahead making the UK look kind of minor, Germany rather significant, but not as significant as it is now in relative terms. And Jim O'Neill returned to this theme, of course, in his book, The Growth Map, which he published 10 years after, in which he said, the problem with what I said in 2001 is I was too conservative. Actually, I was even more right than I thought I was even at the time. <laughs> what do you expect from a Manchester United supporter? <laughs> the... Debate about this accelerated or, or took on new forms as the decade, the noughties, uh, took shape. It could have gone away. It could have gone away. I mean, Jim O'Neill could have become simply another economist making another dodgy prediction, of which there have been many. Two things, I think, then happened to give greater meaning to this. And it wasn't just to do with what happens in Asia. It was what's happening elsewhere. Firstly, there were the, there's the kind of consequences of the Bush foreign policy, which led many people to the conclusion that America had weakened itself, eroded its power, and in a sense, had done the opposite of what Bush had intended, namely, had accelerated American decline rather than rebuilding the foundations of a new secure American empire. So there's very much a sense that the Bush foreign policy and the failures of it perceived to be in Asia, in, uh, and particularly in the Middle East, uh, had laid the foundations for a new world order. America was no longer number one and couldn't be number one after such a disastrous set of policies, particularly in, in Iraq. And then, of course, to add to woes of the Bush administration to the United States, the global financial crash of 2007 and 2008, when the world financial system nearly collapsed completely. How and why it has not, of course, is a larger matter, uh, whether it's down to Saint Ben Bernanke, or whether it's just down to plain luck, we shall, no doubt the historians will debate. But clearly in the wake of both the backlash against the Bush foreign policy and the global financial crisis, a double whammy if ever there was one, it accelerated even more rapidly this sense that the world was shifting, that the old norm could no longer hold, that the old order was going. And not surprisingly, in 2008, two further books appeared, a number of other books appeared, making, broadly speaking, although in a different language, uh, the same kind of point. Firstly, in 2008 appeared the book by Kishori Mabubani, on, which had the subtitle, The Irresistible Power Shift from West to East. Kishore, again, is not one who hides his light under any bushel, as we well know. And he was quite clear that the West had got it wrong, the West should stop preaching to Asia, and should just smell the coffee, and Asia was the future. He slightly modified his views subsequently, I'd noticed. And the other one um, was Farid Sakaria in his extraordinarily popular and extremely influential book, The Post-American World. Now, Farid is a little bit more careful, I suppose, in his choice of words than the Kishori can be sometimes. But nonetheless, the same kind of message comes out of the Sakaria volume, namely 
that the world is changing. The great change after the end of the Cold War isn't that America won it or the West won it. It is the great capitalist revolution that flowed from it. And this great capitalist revolution, as, uh, as Fareed Zakaria puts it, has shifted economic power more and more to those underdeveloped or developing countries we never thought would develop, namely those in Asia, but many more as well, Indonesia, uh, Turkey, even Mexico, and Poland itself. In other words, those who have been outside the charm circle would now enter into the charm circle, and the door had been opened by capitalist and capitalist globalization. That's the most important result of the end of the Cold War, not, if you like, the victory of the West or the victory of the United States. Others jumped on the bandwagon uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, some very nice and decent social democratic liberal friends of mine like Paul Kennedy. Paul, as you remember, had written back in 1987 on the rise and fall of all great powers, including the United States. He added that last chapter in on America, which helped sell the book. But thereafter, he was criticized for having made the argument back in 87 about the decline of America, however relative. And Paul made the same point again a few years later now, in 2010, in the House Journal of Chatham House, that this, uh, the, the new Asian century awaited. The West was in decline. And of course, some less liberal figures joined in the debate, including our own dear, much beloved Neil Ferguson. Um, Neil had written a, 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 a typically interesting book, although one that I think many people would not necessarily agree with. In his book on civilization, he talked of the six killer apps, the six killer apps that had made the West what the West was, namely dominant. He was worried increasingly by 2010 that the West had lost the killer instinct, but the killer apps had been taken up elsewhere. He kind of moved around on this issue. He didn't quite entirely take, go to the whole line that the American empire was finished, that the, uh, the moment opened up by, by Christopher Columbus was over, but he did come fairly close to a kind of beginning of century pessimism about the future of the West, and indeed the future may now not lie in the West, but indeed may lie elsewhere, and particularly in Asia. So in brief, what has been articulated, the underlying assumptions of the three white papers over the last few months in, the, in Australia, builds on an already pre-existing consensus. Not everybody agrees with it, and I'm going to be one of those who wants to raise questions about it. I think this new narrative also, by the way, just to add a final point here, is, is more than just about Asia. It's more than just about thinking about the future being Asian. Um, I think the notion of a rise of the East, as it's often uh, characterized, is also married to another idea, namely the notion of a decline of the West. You know, Spengler is back. You know, the notion that there's a kind of a a kind of dialectic between the rise of one, the decline of another, very much hardwired into our way of thinking, and I think has formed part of this current debate. The West is declining while the East is rising. I think there's a second dimension to this too, and again, it's more implicit, and I'll say something about that this evening, that the increasing importance of Asia Pacific, even a, an Asian century emerging, is also taken to mean the decreasing importance of the transatlantic area. If you like, the future belongs to one ocean. That ocean is around the Pacific and the rim and the countries around that. It no longer belongs to what we might call the transatlantic core, around which you might say the world economy and the world system has revolved for three to four hundred years. The transatlantic moment is passed in the same way that the Western moment has passed. And I suppose implicit within all this again, although again it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not outlined in the, on the Australian documents at all, but I think in the wider debate it is clearly there, namely that if there's a new Asian centre, it must suggest that somebody else's is coming to an end. It must suggest by implication that if there's a new Asian century, which will be the 21st, the 20th century, which was American, is now over. So there's also a series of built-in assumptions, not always in these documents, but built into this wider and larger debate. How do I respond to this? Well, firstly, as a good empiricist, I don't want to deny economic facts. Um, there's no need, in fact, to dispute some self-evident uh, contemporary economic facts about 
China's growing uh, economic importance. You don't have to get into a debate on that. It seems self-evident that it's happening. Um, you don't have to tell anybody Australia about the importance of China to the Australian economy. Uh, and nor do you have to tell uh, Brazil, nor do you have to tell Africa, and nor do you have to tell the Asian region. Uh, as indeed Jim O'Neill observed in the Growth Map book, which by the way, excellent book, he made the clear point that one of the things that convinced him that the world was changing was China's leadership, if you want to call it that, following the East Asian financial crisis of 1997 and 1998. He said, this not only showed political nous and economic clout, it showed some vision of the future for its own region. So one doesn't have to, in a sense, question the facts. Uh, one doesn't even have to question the argument that Asia's growing economic weight within the world order is, 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 is there for everybody to see. Go to Japan, ask anybody in Japan, and they know that they, they are now number three, whereas before they were clearly uh, a number two. Asia has become, and China in particular, has become the engine uh, of a sluggish world economy, particularly over the last few years. Nor do I want to deny, as... Uh, and, and, and nor indeed should I or would want to deny the, the importance of poverty reduction in all this. Danny Kwa, my good colleague at the LSE, and I hope somebody I hope you can get down here in the future to give you an entirely different story than the one I'm going to tell you today. Danny is quite clear about this. If one's looking at poverty reduction over the last 25, 20 years, there's one place to look, and mainly only one place to look, and that's largely Asia and particularly particularly China. It's an uneven story, of course, because India, of course, the issues of poverty are much more acute. And then finally, of course, um, there's no disputing the rise of a new class in the world. And this is not the working class, unfortunately, for the left. It is the rise of the new middle class, the new heroes of the 21st century, a consuming new middle class. And nobody needs to run away from that particular sociological outcome of these great economic changes. As I always say, the people who have benefited most from the rising middle classes of Asia are not just people in Australia, people in Asia. Go and ask the French wine industry. They sell 30% of their best growths now through Hong Kong. Indeed, ask the German car industry where they can sell its most expensive, ex expensive vehicles. And again, they know where they're selling them. So everybody's benefiting from this. So this is not the point. The point is not to deny what I would call some underlying economic realities. The question is where we place this. That's my point. Where do we place this new narrative? And I suppose, coming from a kind of a, a British background, but with an Irish mother, um, I, I, I get quite contrarian and then think that if everybody's agreeing on certain things, there must be a reason to disagree. This is, after all, what the LSE tells you to do, not just to look for the causes of things, but to be bloody-minded. After all, in some senses, you could say the LSE would never have been created if there hadn't been a bit of bloody-mindedness around in the late 19th century. It was called Fabian Socialism, a very mild and nice bourgeois form of socialism, to be sure, but nonetheless, they were bloody-minded people to go ahead and create this school. I think it was largely to put two fingers up to Oxford and Cambridge, which I, of course, entirely applaud. So when I, when I confront a consensus, my, fir my, first, my first natural instinct, I suppose, given both who I am, where I've come from, my peculiar political history, is to, is to kind of think what's wrong with it and to challenge it, and at least to ask awkward questions about it and uncomfortable ones. I suppose I'll raise three large questions. One, in the rush to identify change, which we should do, and IR, if it doesn't identify change, is in trouble. And governments will be in trouble, too. And I can understand exactly where the Australian government is coming from on this. Uh, in the rush to identify change, which is interesting, dare I say sexy, even though I'm on TV, there's also an underlying in inclination, I think, to fail to un identify sources of continuity. Continuity is not necessarily interesting as much as is change. Change is new, therefore novel, therefore more interesting than talking about continuities. There's been much talk, secondly, of shift, power shifts, but little talk of the underlying structures that are not so amenable to shifts. My great colleague at the LSE many years back, now long deceased, sadly, Susan Strange, 
talked of structural power and said, all this talk about changing the world, she was talking in the 1970s, by the way, and attacking those who talked about American decline, they forget the structure of power, that all the short-term problems as America facing then do not underline, undermine the fundamental structure of, of American power itself. And in a way, part of what I'm going to do is inspired by Susan Strange's notion of structural power, that these are more deeply embedded than the changes themselves, or at least have to be taken into account as well as the change itself. And I say thirdly that I think the debate revolves around a very incomplete, sometimes misleading, not often very clear discussion about what people understand by power. Largely, I would suggest, much of the discussion about power shift has been about trade, who buys cement, who buys cars, who buys Lafitte, Rothschild, where is growth coming from, where is poverty being reduced, all entirely legitimate questions, all largely economic questions, but I don't think power alone is defined by simple, crude, material, quantitative, uh, in that quantitative way. I'd also throw into this as another, as another warning about prediction. Having been somebody who's never got the future right, uh, from the end of the Cold War to the Japanese financial collapse of 1991, through to the attack of 9-11, concluding with the complete failure of nearly everybody, except one or two deviants, to get the 2007-2008 financial crisis right. I think we've got to be careful about unilinear projections and predictions about the future. We have been skewered on our bad predictions over the last 15 and 20 years. And I find it, for one at least, deeply worrying as a social scientist, not for any empirical reasons, but just instinct. My guts tell me, beware predictions. For the one thing we can know about most of the predictions we have made of a unilinear character over the last 25 years, that we've been wrong. And so we've got to again be a little bit aware that when Goldman Sachs, bless the cotton socks, make these dear predictions about where the world economy is going to be in 2030 and 2050, and they know, then I suppose my instinct as a social scientist who believes that events, upsets, things come around you never predicted, unanticipated events, all these things, it seems to me, do have to be taken into consideration. It could well be that they are right. All I want to suggest is they may also be wrong. I want to engage this discussion at four levels, very, but not for too long, I, I, I hope. One is about what we mean by the notion of an Asian century, firstly. Now, the term century, when applied either to a region or particularly to a country, was, of course, invented by an American. Who else? It was invented by Henry Luce in a famous article in February 1941. When he was thinking about the world in which America found itself, what America had to do, what American mission should be, and what the opportunities there were both for the United States and indeed for the world. America had to pick up its responsibilities, understand that it had the power, and to recognize that until it fulfilled its ambition, broke with the tradition of isolationism, there would not actually be anybody's century. Uh, within a few months, Japan answered the question uh, and then, of course, the Cold War provided further answers to the question, what would be the American mission? But Luce's notion, if we're using the notion of an American century in the sense that it was originally meant, and of course, one is using Asian century today with all the kind of resonances of Henry Luce's original idea of an American century, how else, why bother to use it, does seem to me to raise a few problems when we apply it to Asia. Um, but firstly, of course, Asia is not a single point of reference. Um, it is a region. The United States was a single, all-powerful state. I think that is important. Um, at, the, at the heart of any great imperial system, or the heart of any great uh, project, or any great civilization, although it's a term I sometimes have problems with, there is usually a single point of power which defines the rest of the area. Uh, if you might, Istanbul did it for the Ottoman Empire, Rome did it for the Roman Empire, London did it for the British Empire, and the United States, Washington, did it 
for what became known as the American Imperium, or possibly what it might even call the American Empire. I don't really care about terms. Who does this in Asia? Where is that point? Where is the Asian country which leads, defines, does what America did, what Istanbul did, what London did, what Washington did? That is highly, that's highly problematic, it seems to me. This may seem like an academic point, but if one goes around using terms like Asian century, and you therefore Im implicitly situating yourself in a larger debate about other centuries, then it seems to me it's something you've got to think quite seriously about. Where is the American equivalent? Where is the Istanbul, if you like? Uh, within, within Asia. I keep talking this point about Istanbul because of simple, simple interest in the, in the Ottoman Empire. Asia is clearly not a single state. It's not even a coherent region. This is not to under, understate the degrees of regional economic integration that have occurred, particularly since the financial crisis of 1997 and 1998. But as Andrew and I, who, who teach a course still with, with, uh, with Triumph through the LSE and, and others around the world, we found this clearly when we were in Shanghai, and what we talked about a lot was not just what Asia has achieved economically, but where the divisions and tensions still lie within Asia, not just between China and Japan, but within the whole region. These are post-colonial states with very strong senses of ethnicity and sovereignty. And therefore, having a collective Asian identity, it seems to me again, is problematic. And therefore, talking of something of an Asian century in a, in a rather easy, too easy way, it seems to me, is, is itself problematic. And it's not at all clear that it has a vision to lead or guide the world. I mean, if one is clearly talking about the one state in Asia with the power, to, the potential power to do so, it is obviously China. But one asks then the question, what is the vision that China has for the world, not just for its region? You cannot have a vision of world leadership in the sense that the United States had it on the basis of non-interference principle or simple sovereignty or not doing anything because you can't interfere into the internal affairs of another state. By definition, a great power with a vision of a new century has to have more than just a constant repetition of the same refrain about non-interference into the internal affairs of other states. That may be imperialism, and I know some would denounce that, but that has been in the nature of previous great powers in the past. And I just don't, but maybe for good reasons as well, and I can understand the Chinese position on this. I don't see that, I don't see that happening. I'd also raise one other point, and it's just a throwaway remark, and it's not meant to be disrespectful to anybody, but is it that what we're really talking about is not an Asian century, what we're really talking about is China anyway? I sometimes think, in my kind of rather naughty way, that really what the Asian century story is really about is a cover story for, talk, for not talking about China. And I think that is really quite important to get that right. Um, if one is going to kind of have a, a, an, an engaged and an, an important discussion on, on, on this particular question. The second point I want to make quickly is, is, is to be even, I hope, even more a revisionist. You didn't invite me all this way to not be revisionist. I am from the LSE, after all, with that Irish mother I talked about. Is the American century over? Well, everywhere I go, I hear American decline talked about. I certainly don't find many people in the United States today who will tell me that the United States is in good shape, um, particularly after the Bush administration, but not just because of Bush, the economic problems, the economic woes. Financial journalists write books which sell in large numbers, telling me the bridges are falling down, the infrastructure is collapsing, that the system is gridlocked, and the middle class are extraordinarily miserable. Indeed, while the middle class is consuming like mad in Asia, the middle class in the United States seems to be disappearing altogether and can't afford their college bills for their kids. And on and on and on it goes. President Obama could be called President Decline, the president who doesn't have a vision for a new world order. Tim Lynch and I have slightly different views on President Obama, you may know. Uh, I, rather, I rather like the man. I think Tim has his reservations. But nonetheless, we can agree that maybe the Obama administration may be symptomatic of a retreat from America's position. I don't think so. I personally don't think so. I personally don't think so. And even, it's not a debate about Obama or Bush. Who cares? It, it, to me, that is intellectually boring after a while. It's again looking at what Susan Strange called the structures of power, not which president happens to occupy the White House at any one particular moment in time. And all I can say, frankly, that all of its problems, all of its difficulties, all of its bridges falling down, all of its miserable middle classes, 
all of its racial tensions, all of the numbers of incarcerated ethnic groups in prisons, all of the problems facing America, and I'm well aware of them, and many, many more besides. Nonetheless, it seems to me that this has been an extraordinarily successful superpower, and it remains one. Indeed, even in the document itself, the DFAT document, there's a recognition, quietly spoken, sort of voce, that the world will actually still have a number one, a number one uh, both policeman, indeed, economic uh, shaper of ideas, namely the United States, for good reasons. The United States, it seems to me, won, although we can debate, de debate how it won, did win the, the long struggle against this most systemically important rival of the 20th century which was the Soviet Union. And it still, therefore, lives in a world which has been shaped and defined by that, which gives, has given it enormous strategic freedom, enormous economic possibility, and enormous political clout. The, the past, the future was tried in the shape of socialism, or actually existing communism, and it failed. Tragically, maybe. Tragically, particularly for the people who had to live under the system, but it failed. And we're still living in that system. And we're still living in that world created by the... We are still living, in that sense, in a post-communist world. And that world, it seems to me, is one where American ideas and influence are now stronger than they were 20 years ago. Stronger than they were 30 years ago. The USA also retains massive hard power. I don't need to go into all the details. China has one very large aircraft carrier. The United States has 11 huge aircraft carriers and aircraft carrier groups. Half of world expenditure on national security is done by America. There is simply no comparison. And when people talk, by the way, of rising China, I wondered if I want to be rising China or declining America militarily, and actually I choose to be declining America militarily. If I was sitting in Beijing, I would be seriously worried about American military power, much more so if I'm sitting in Washington looking at the rise of Beijing militarily. The USA can also claim a good deal of soft power. It projects power, too, through as a series of alliances. Power isn't just about what you've got. It's who's drawn towards you, who wants to be part of your team. Team America, if you want to put it like that. Why? Now, again, on many on the left would decry this, and I again understand why, because it's an uncomfortable fact. But states around the world have been drawn in their, in their very large numbers to want American protection and America, and no more so than in Asia. What, after all, was the American tilt to Asia all about? Oh, sorry, rebalancing. I'm sorry, I shouldn't use tilt because that has now been abandoned. But what was that all about? Was it America imposing itself on countries such as Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, the Philippines? No. It was those countries demanding an American presence in the region to reassure them against the rise of the perceived problem posed by China. That doesn't look like a declining power. NATO, by the way, still exists. People still knocking on the door to join it. So, you know, again, uh, this kind of narrative of, a, of the end of an American century, it seems to me, doesn't, it's not quite so straightforward, it seems to me, particularly when one looks at still the size of the American economy, 25% still of the world GDP, and the role of the dollar. Bruce Cummings, a very good a colleague and friend of mine from the University of Chicago, a radical, a radical to, his, to his toenails. Nonetheless, realistically enough, in his great book on the Pacific, an American that's a Pacific power, nonetheless, I think, I think gets it absolutely right, that this talk of an American decline or the rise of a new Asia, it, it simply ignores how much power the US still retains. And you could add to that, um, if you look at, say, universities as sources of power, and we're bound to, aren't we? <laughs> We've got an invested interest in this one. Um, well, I even do things like look at university league tables. You always do it when you're near the top, don't you? Melbourne and LSE love league tables. You know why. <laughs> Self-interested, of course. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you're looking at the international league tables in universities, which is a source of power, cultural power, it's a form of soft power. We know it. Not just material power. It's not just overseas students pay a lot of money. It is the, it is the power of ideas, the power of attraction. Guess what? Nearly 50% of the top 100 universities located in the United States of America. And by the way, if the United States was in decline, why do so many of the Chinese new elite bourgeoisie send their children to Cornell, Harvard, and Yale? That's not a sign of a declining superpower, it seems to me. Who's going to who? Who's sending whom to which capital in order to get education for their children? Interesting. 
You can't run away from that. It says something. The FT 500 uh, of, of top 500 companies in the world, corporations, I even do some economics occasionally, uh, usually after a couple of glasses of decent wine. I couldn't be an economist, as you may have guessed by now. I just looked at the FT 500 for last year, for 2012, top corporations in the world. Here's declining America. 15 of 24 are American. Well, 25 out of 50 are American. 49 out of 100 top corporations by value, because that's what the FT measures. Forbes and, the, and Fortune do a different measurement, are American. Now, it may have gone down by some amount. It isn't to deny the rise of other major corporations in the world, China, Brazil, even Russia. Uh, it's not to deny the rise of the emergence of Japan. That's okay. Research and development tells a similar kind of story. In other words, I think we have too easily bought in to a narrative of American decline without thinking seriously what it means. This is not to deny American problems. No way. Nor is it to say that America can lead in the way that it once did. Uh, but nonetheless, I still think we need to think a bit more seriously what we are doing about simply saying that we are now moving ineluctably, inevitably, and irresistibly to a post-American world in which America will no longer be the same kind of player that it has been in the past. It won't be the same kind of player, but it will still be a fundamental point of reference and number one in that world. What about the transatlantic? I'm bound to say something about this, given that I live, up, live beside it. <laughs> it's almost disappeared from the debate. Asia exists, but the transatlantic area doesn't seem to any longer. I can understand if I was living in Australia. What's the point of talking about the transatlantic economy insofar as much of the economic activity in this part of the world, of course, is, is related to Asia? But still, we've got to have a larger global perspective. We do live in an interconnected world economy. What happens in A is going to be impacted by B and impacted by C and D. So I actually do buy into globalization. I do think it's true. Very unfashionable thing to say, maybe, but I do. If we look at the transatlantic economy or the transatlantic space, again, the story is not just an, an Asian one. That's the obvious point I'm trying to make. Um, the transatlantic economy still accounts for, for between 40 to 50% of world GDP. That's a hell of a lot of GDP located on either side of the, of the, two, of the two shores of the Atlantic in North America and in the EU. The transatlantic economic space is home to the majority of the world's biggest banks, for good or ill. About 60%, and most of the most important currencies, the dollar, uh, the pound, and indeed, even still the euro. Uh, the USA and the European Union together comprise about 70% of the top 25 global corporations. They are 71% together of world foreign direct investment. Well, this is not exactly something which is being bypassed by, by history, as some would seem to argue. It is the major provider of global services. And also, by the way, the European Union, including the United Kingdom, which, by the way, is still a member of the European Union, though if my government continues for the next three years, it may not be. The EU is home to the other large share of world-ranked universities. So the transatlantic actually is far more important. And it's actually very important down here, too. Because with that axis of the world economic order as it's been, and maybe it's changing, I accept, if that goes badly wrong, as indeed it has been going badly wrong, particularly through the European crisis, then it has impacts down here, as it clearly has already had so, because of the impact on growth rates in China. And then I end, really, with the reflections on what is meant when people talk of the decline of the West. Now, the notion of the West is, I know, highly problematic. It, it can carry racist connotations. It can carry con connotations of superiority. It can indeed be a synonym for imperialism and colonialism. All the negatives of this, this concept, it's a highly difficult... It's one we can't avoid using, but it's one we have great difficulty in defining. And sometimes we even feel, some people at least feel very uncomfortable in saying this, or talking about Western values, because you then can't oppose that to other people's values, the West is best. You know the story and why some, there's problems with this. The only point I'd make here is, is it, the implication that the rise of the East is somehow at the expense of the West, or that Western ideas are being superseded, it seems to me, again, is problematic. Uh, 
It seems we've fallen too easily into this narrative of the rise of the East, the decline of the West, without thinking exactly what we're talking about here. And let me just make two or three quick points on this one. Firstly, I find it difficult to think of the emergence of Asia and the great successes that it has it is experienced and will experience in the future without, in the first instance, without the United States during the Cold War. I mean, the, the rise of Asia, after all, doesn't begin over the last 10 years. It goes back to Japan in the 1950s and the 1960s. And part, part of the reason for that, part of the reason, not the only reason, of course, I'm not, I'm not decrying efforts of ordinary peoples in ordinary Asian countries and ordinary uh, entrepreneurs in those countries, but part of that was because the United States provided a security framework and a major market in which it would absorb uh, Japanese and then later South Korean goods. Can we imagine the success of South Korea without South Korea? South Korea wouldn't even exist. <laughs> without the United States. The Japanese economic miracle of the early 1950s actually began during the Korean War. If you want to look at the political economy of war and its importance. The very fact that the United States remains an Asian power is therefore, it seems to be been crucial to redefining what Asia and how Asia has emerged. China's own rise, and this again is not one I'm saying is entirely down to the United States, of course not. That would be a nonsense. Um, and I'm trying not to talk too much nonsense, though some. China's own rise is for a variety of reasons. Partly it's based on the success of the communist system, the, the success in creating a unified state, in educating women, and in eliminating illiteracy. I mean, there's, there's some ways in which you could argue that the foundation of a successful state capitalism in China has been based on, on, the, on the very system they're trying to leave behind in some respects, without all the excesses of Maoism. Nonetheless, it, I don't think it's too coincidental that the rise of China through the reforms of the 1970s, then into the 1980s and 1990s, actually does have something to do with the fact that China and the United States opened up an entirely new relationship throughout the 1970s, which then opened up new relationships between Australia and China, Japan and China, the region and China. The United States had, to, in a sense, to give the green light to everybody else to engage with China and provide a benign environment for, for China's, China's development. In that sense, China's rise, I think, has been in part a function of an American grand strategy. America now has to deal with the outcomes and the consequences of that, but it is not unconnected to that. And I wouldn't want to say too much either about the importance of the Western economies for Asia. And even what we mean by the East, it seems to me is interesting. And again, I, I simply raise this as an intellectual question. Is it the East is emerging and rising in the way in which people now argue it is because it has abandoned Western practices or adopted them? And Mabubani, it seems to me, is not somebody I always agree with, and certainly in certain of his earlier writings, it seems to me has made a very strong point here, that the very triumph of the East is actually a triumph for the West. And, and not in the sense of triumph simply for the East. So if we talk of the decline of the West, we're really talking about something really quite problematic, it seems to me, given that it's been the adoption of Western practices created by a security framework provided by the United States that has made the rise of the East feasible. Conclusion. Does it matter? <laughs> Am I just a cantankerous Brit who's still got jet lag? Is any of this uh, important? Am I not being churlish? Am I being a typical white European angry at losing status? Or as Danny Quad nearly said to me the other day, the problem is, Mick, you can't hack the fact that Asia's on the rise. Not true. Just not true. The reason I raise these questions are, are, are entirely different. It's not a question of political correctness or anything like that. Um, I have no hang-ups on those issues at all, believe me. I think, firstly, as a social scientist and international relations scholar coming from a great university, uh, I think facts matter. <laughs> Empirical accuracy is quite important. Getting, getting some facts right. I know within the postmodern canon there are no such thing as facts. I'm really quite boring and old-fashioned on this. I think there are a few out there, and you can, you can find them. It just takes a lot of time going around digging them out. Reading FT500s, Fortune 500s, US military expenditures, best university league tables. These are not terribly interesting things to do late at night, believe me, but I do them. I think the facts also point to a more complicated and richer picture of the world. 
I think what we're getting is a rather one-dimensional picture of the world, and I think we need a richer, more complicated uh, picture of this world. The facts also point to a, a global picture, which I feel much more comfortable with, rather than just a picture which is focusing in on one part of the world only. And it also brings us into the questions of interdependence. And here again, I come out as a total champion, at least, uh, a rec rec at least recognizing the reality of globalization. Um, it isn't a single part of the world's story. And finally, and I'll conclude here, um, and then open up to uh, some criticisms, and I hope some, some wonderful compliments. You know, I have an ego, you know. Um, I'm as thin-skinned as every other academic in the world. Um, I actually do think there's been far too much uh, loose talk, to use a phrase, of some parts of the world rising and some parts of the world falling. It's good. I, I understand why it's done. And in some senses, I do it myself. Um, the rise and fall of great powers sells books. Interdependence sounds really dull. Um, Continuity doesn't sound so interesting as global change, power shift. But I do think there's been far too much vague talks about parts of the world or other states rising, other states falling. Why I worry about this isn't just because I buy into a kind of a naive liberal version of globalization. I don't think I do. I, I, I buy into a rather realist view of globalization, rather different. I think it is because it can set off a certain sense of insecurities and worries and concerns. And I think this is where the danger in foreign policy terms to me lies. And that's the point of why I'm giving this lecture, partly because I like lecturing, but partly because I do this for a purpose. And the purpose of this is I think that we are getting ourselves potentially, uh, not necessarily in Australia so much, but potentially into what I call a security dilemma where we are both underestimating our own power, the power of the West, the power of the United States, if I could put it like that, and we're overstating the challenges posed by changes taking place in other parts of the world. In that sense, by the way, the DFAT document is pretty good. At that level, I think it's good because it doesn't look in those terms. It actually looks at opportunities and, 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 and what one can get out of the of the, of the new rise. But there's many more out there in the hard foreign policy world, and particularly in Washington, and particularly in the University of Chicago, where my good friend John Mearsheimer teaches, who are talking very strongly that this power shift is the greatest moment of danger, is the greatest moment of threat, and one that if we follow that logic through, we're going to end up not with the new opportunities in the 21st century, but increasing conflict. And that, at least, is one reason why I'm giving this lecture here this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mick. Um, my name is Andrew Walter, and I'm a professor of international relations here at the University of Melbourne in the School of Social and Political Sciences and in the new Melbourne School of Government. Um, I was until recently, as Mick uh, said, uh, a colleague at the London School of Economics, which I think is why I've been asked uh, to do this final part of the evening. And what we have now is about uh, 10 minutes for question and answer. Um, I can see some hands going up already. There are three rules. Uh, ask a short question, wait for a microphone, and please state briefly who you are. So who would like, we have two roving microphones up here at the back, and perhaps bring the second microphone down here. And we will take three questions in a block. Sorry, I'd like to make a comment rather than a question, if I may. My name's John Richardson. I, I think it was a very interesting presentation, and I thank you for that, uh, Professor Cox. But I, I think you fundamentally misrepresent the concept of Australia in the Asian century, oh dear. which, by the way, was prepared by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, not by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, okay. and a task force set up in that context. I, mean, I think the fundamental idea uh, behind the Asia century um, is that we are going through a period in which globalization has led to a massive reduction in the costs of technology transfer, which with suitable systems of governance in place will over time mean that economies around the world will move towards a 
economic size proportionate to their demographic size. Not in except, uh, not in except sorry, not absolutely certainly, because governance um, is a critical component um, in that regard. So what it is essentially arguing is that in Australia's immediate region, you have a number of very large countries which will over time develop their economies to a point um, that they are uh, extremely uh, large. And the purpose essentially of that document is to pose the question to the Australian public the Australian population of what we in Australia need to do to adapt domestically to take advantage of those changes. It is not to reject the importance of our linkages with Europe and it is most certainly not to reject the importance of the United States which remains um, absolutely central to Australian foreign policy and overall uh, perceptions of the international order. I then think you go on to make uh, a couple of other problems. Oh, yeah. One is you then conflate economic size with military power and soft power. And thirdly, yes, because I think you are arguing that um, automatically a rise in economic power um, leads to a rebalancing of military power. Yes, it may do, and certainly in the past it has done. Okay. But it's not, in it. it's again, not absolutely essential that that will happen and it will therefore lead to conflict. And I think the third thing, which perhaps you don't look at when you looked at the, the West, which is okay. really important, is the legacy um, of the Western system, international order. And I absolutely agree with you with many of the areas of continuity that you outline in relation to the United States will remain um, uh, in critical playing uh, factors in the maintenance of the US as a major uh, world power, if not the major international power for the foreseeable future. And part of that um, is that there will be a maintenance um, of the international order as we know it. But the challenge is to actually preserve that um, with the, and accommodate the rise of other powers. Okay, thank you uh, very much. What, what, what's your question? Uh, it was a comment. Oh, it was a comment. Okay, fine. So just ponder those comments. Uh, ponder please, those. short, brief questions. Yes. Just up like up there, there was a uh, microphone, has, which is there. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Peter Rennie. I'm with Leadership Australia. Um, Sorry, Peter, I, can't, I can't hear you very well. Uh, Peter Rennie with Leadership yeah. Australia. Okay. Um, there was a book written by Peter Turchin uh, called War, Peace, War. Yeah. And he looked at um, the rise and fall of empires and so on. And what he was able to show was that it was largely social disintegration that preceded a fall of a great power. Uh, social disintegration isn't something that you discussed um, today, particularly right. in the United States, and yet it seems to be occurring. Could you comment on that, please? I'll do my best. Okay, was sure. there one, one more quick one up the back, if we could pass the microphone up there? Thanks, thanks Mick. Uh, Lee Jones from Queen Mary University of London. Um, I bring a couple with me, you know, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to flatter your ego, Mick. Oh dear. Um, the, I wonder whether the uh, West versus East, Asia versus Europe, transatlantic versus Asia, these are old hat concepts that we ought to be ditching. Yeah. Um, these are geographical spatial concepts that don't map onto some of the most important dynamics. And isn't it the case that the really important dynamics in the age of globalization is the transnational uh, nature of economic and social flows? So the rise of China is facilitated by the transnationalization of production, which has tied together spaces in new and complex ways. Yeah. And one of the most important uh, things to change is the rise of a transnational capitalist class. And so in that sense, the rise of Asia from Australia's perspective is not actually something that happens out there. It's also something that happens in here. And so you see the rise of new business elites, new oligarchic fat cats like Gina Reinhart, for example, the business interests of Clive Palmer in iron ore mining are, are intrinsically bound up with state strategies in China. Mm. And that is what leads to the call for new forms of integration. And that is simply not captured in these West versus rest uh, 
uh, West versus Asia, US versus China, um, old-fashioned IR concepts. Okay, well, I'll just very be I'll briefly touch on that. I mean, I, I knew that once I said anything about Australian foreign policy, somebody would get up and tell me that I got it wrong. Um, I, I think you maybe misunderstood what I said. I mean, I wasn't trying to say what Australian foreign policy is wrong. I, I, what I was really trying to argue I mean, in very simplified form, uh, in a rather sympathetic way, I thought, rather than your response. I mean, I actually said there's quite a lot they got right. Um, and there were three documents, not one, so I tried to look at the totality of it, not just one document. But I think the only point I was really trying to drive at, and it's a very simple point, was the underlying premise of all three foreign policy documents was an assumption that the future belonged to Asia. And then there, was some, there was something called an emerging Asian century. If they just said Asia, I'd have been happy. But it's when you start utilizing the grandiose, grandiloquent kind of concepts of century that one has to start worrying. And that was all I was trying to suggest. And that if you, if you kind of use that kind of language and you, get, you, give it, you attach it to a document, then people are going to think that there is a big shift taking place, a power shift taking place. And what I then tried to do in the second part of my lecture, which I don't think you heard or I didn't give clearly enough, but I, I won't give again, was to actually point out that for 10 years, this kind of notion of power shift has been built into a debate. And, 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 and in that sense, Australia, and, that's what I, and that's what I was then going on to try and critique. That was all I was trying, trying to do. If you want, I could actually say I think DFAC got quite a lot right in that. Uh, and if you actually combine it with the other two documents on national security and DOD, it does give you a relatively reasonable picture of where Australia lies in the world. You've got to take all three, it seems to me, together and not one alone. Then you might get a wider, wider angle. I hope that's enough party political broadcast on behalf of the Australian government. Um, on the question of social disintegration inside the USA, look, um, and I agree, empires can fall for all sorts of reasons. You know, they can rule, the barbarians are at the gate and get into the gate. Uh, you can overextend yourself, as Paul Kennedy put it, imperial overstretch. You can, you can collapse simply because you lose wars. That's the biggest way in which empires have usually, usually finished, because they engaged in a war they then lost. The one thing we can be pretty sure about the United States is not going to engage in a great power war and lose it, because A, I don't think there's going to be a great power war, and, be, and, and secondly, if there was one, I'm not sure America would be the loser, but that's a larger question. Therefore, you come to the internal reasons as to why, as to why America may be in trouble. Yes, there are a lot of problems, and I did point to those problems. I even kept going on about bridges falling down and the middle classes getting miserable. Um, and, and that was a kind of funny pun way of kind of making the point that there are some ma major social problems with inside the United States of America. No doubt about it. Yet, yet, I, I think one has to be a little bit careful not to push this too far. I mean, there is still a very powerful ideology in America. It's called Americanism. If you go to the United States, you will find more flags on every garage and not on every government building. There is a very powerful socialization mechanism that operates within America. Americans may no longer believe quite so clearly in the American dream as it was understood in the 50s and 60s, but they still believe in the idea of the United States of America. Um, moreover, the United States has great capacities for recuperation, great capacities for recuperation, and great capacities for absorption of different peoples. It is a, a world... It's a world country. Everybody from around the world can almost see themselves in the United States in one form or another, whether you're Jewish, Polish, Irish, British, Asian, African, and indeed Latinos. And that, I think, again, gives the America enormous social power. I mean, there are those who believe that, for instance, the Latinization or the Hispanicization of America. Sam Huntington wrote this rather unfortunate book on this whole question. Uh, and I think he simply misunderstood how America's been so successful. It draws immigrants in, it brings them in, brings their talents in, and that strengthens, it seems to me, the United States and doesn't lead to the disintegrative consequences that you, you suggest. In other words, I think the social order in America is actually a good deal stronger than was implicit in, in, your, in, in your interesting question. On the question of being old-fashioned, well, yes, I am. Can't help it. Um, I still, I still think states matter. I still think measuring military power of the United States matters. Um, you know, I, I, that isn't that I, I completely go against your, your point, Lee, on this one. I mean, I do think there are larger transnational, uh, you know, non-state factors in all this, corporations, markets, the transnational elite, elite classes you're talking about. But still, 
I suppose I'm old-fashioned enough, Lee, still to think that states do matter. And they matter mostly, by the way, to the policymakers sitting in Beijing, and they matter particularly importantly to those sitting in Washington. And they think in terms of national power. They do think in terms of, unfortunately, in terms of rising and falling, of a, a partial zero-sum game in which they're engaged. Therein lies the problem. Maybe that old-fashioned thinking, which I'm part of, may also be part of the problem, but I'm prepared to accept that as a, as a criticism. I think we've got a round, uh, time for another quick round of questions. We've got a couple over here, and we've got a couple down here. Perhaps we can take four. I think I can see two here and two over there. Have uh, you got the microphone? Yeah. yeah. My name is Lodewijk Fink here. I was very happy when you mentioned that you believe in facts. However, I stopped counting after 50 when you mentioned 50 times America. America is a continent, not a country. Have you ever seen American treasury notes? So, say that again. America is a... Continent, not a country. Oh. It is not my fault, nor it is your fault, that <laughs> the United States forgot to give their own country a name. But when you keep saying America... <laughs> It is offensive to 550 million Spanish-speaking people that live right. on the American well, continent. I'm sorry if I was... Just, I didn't politics think. is so always a local a politics. Question. Okay, and the following question then is, I'm very surprised when you, when you forgot to mention China is a puppet of the United States created by um, Kissinger to put a million soldiers on the Russian border and Kmart, the same as the East India Company, wanting cheap products into their stores. So it is a fabrication that China is actually a rising power. Okay. okay, and Fiona? Okay, we have some good questions. <laughs> Mine's a very quick question. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, the question of debt, Neil Ferguson's point that China own, own, owns a, the United States debt, and whether you think that has any influence on the rise and fall, or you know, his argument yeah. that, it, that it sort of perpetuates this possibility of conflict. Okay. Okay. Sure. Pradeep, over here. Yeah, sure. Pradeep okay. Deneja from the School of Social and Political Sciences right. here. Professor Cox, you referred to, you talked about the Pacific as the focus, mm. but in this country, a new construct, the Indo-Pacific, is mm. being promoted. Yeah, okay. And in fact, the prime ministers of Australia, India, and recently Vietnam have also embraced. I mean, this is one sure. construct which is very popular here, sure. but not, certainly not in China. Mm. So mm. I wonder what your thoughts are on the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> okay, um, well, thanks. Sir. Yeah. Hans over here. In the okay, room. fine. Well, I mean... Uh, Mick, sorry, we'll just take okay, one, yeah, one last yeah, one five, over six. here. In okay, the okay. Um, I, I'm Hans Baer. Uh, I came to your talk the other uh, night. Yeah, and you, you, and, you um, gave me a rough time then, I remember. Yeah, well, I'm it. about to give you a rough time again. <laughs> Good. Um, because, again, you did not touch on the ecological crisis. As I'm sure you know, China and the US are number one and number two in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and they're both committed to this idea of perpetual economic uh, growth. Yep. Uh, China now has many of the most polluted cities uh, in the world. And uh, again, this is uh, contributing to climate change, uh, the melting of glaciers uh, perhaps over the next several decades. Uh, in the Himalayas, uh, which is going to mean very drastic uh, impact on, on China in terms of access to water. Yeah. Uh, so wh what are your thoughts on how environmentally sustainable or unsustainable uh, the, the two powers, wh what they're doing that, that you mentioned in your yeah. talk? Okay. Thank you. Mick, you have about three minutes. Oh, have got three minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Um, all right, I'll start now. Uh, well, I, I, there, was, there was no insult intended to, to the peoples of South or Latin America. I mean, the, using the word America, North America, the United States, I mean, okay, these are, we should be more careful with our words, for which, therefore, I apologize. But I was talking about the United States of America, and I wasn't trying to dismiss anybody south of the Rio Grande, but far from it. Um, you, however, do raise an interesting question about, which I kind of think is a more interesting point, if I might say. Um, you kind of talked about the, fabricate, the, the kind of fabrication of China rising. Now, I don't think there's a fabrication. I think China is, seri it is seriously changing and is, is sh reshaping the world. I don't think you can say it's a fabrication, to use your own terms. Nonetheless, I think you do point to something which I think is serious, um, which is um, how and why and under what conditions China has emerged. And it's clearly emerged, as I indeed argued, within a framework which was already predetermined or shaped by the West itself. 
So in some senses, China's emergence has been, ma has been made possible. And I would want to put, push this argument even further than, than, than I did in the, in the lecture, but thinking that this actually may be, as I indeed said, this actually could be seen not so much as a challenge to the West, although I think it may emerge in the realist sense that it will become one or is one, but it also could be a massive addition to the West. Um, that's the point. I mean, cheap clothing, you know, cheap goods, all the rest. It's been, in a sense, you, I mean, as, as, as a good colleague of mine, a good old Marxist mate of mine said at the LSE recently, thank God for China, it saved capitalism over the last four to five years. You know, here's the greatest irony. 80 million led Communist Party in China saving capitalism, probably running capitalism better than the capitalists can ever try and do. So, you know, and this to me seems like a, the deepest historical irony of the first part of the 21st century. And I think that is maybe what we should be talking about as much, if not more, than just talking about the rising and falling of powers and, and the China threat. I don't buy into the China threat. I, I kind of I downplay that quite strongly in some other things I've written. And if we start talking in those terms, and this is why I do applaud what DFAT did in his document, then I do think you get into the security dilemma, the arms racing, and all the dangers that accompany that. And that is where we potentially could be over the next two to three years, as indeed Hugh White himself, I think, realistically made that point. Uh, China's debt to the United States and the purchase of treasury bonds and all the rest. I, I think a lot has been made of the fact that it owns about 1.3 trillion, but Japan, I think, owns about the same amount. The European Union owns about the same amount. So one should not overestimate this. Indeed, I would equally argue that China is as much dependent on the United States economy as China, as America is on China. In other words, it's an interdependence, mutually assured economic destruction. And it, within that, in that sense, therefore, we, there is great hope because I think there are huge economic incentives for both states actually to always pull back from any serious point of conflict. And I think that is a really, that is what is different. And it's not like a pre-1914 situation. There's such loose talk. We're in a pre-1914, I think that's just codswallop, absolute nonsense. And one of the reasons it's codswallop is precisely because this levels of interdependence between China and, and the United States. And indeed China in its own reach, and China and Japan. I think even that will draw both countries back from the dangers in which they have sometimes have got themselves over the past. On the India-Pacific, I mean, I, I take your point on board. I think that's a, a very important point. Um, wh what I have a worry with is, is not so much the geography of all this. It's simply the utilization of a notion called an Asian century. I even had some worries with the original notion of, a Europe of, of, of an American century. You could even have questions about that. It's when you generalized it way beyond geography to meaning something more that, that, that I had the concerns that I had, that's all. And on the ecological, I'm sorry I didn't deal with the ecological issues. Um, but then I didn't deal with a lot of other things. Uh, so I didn't have time. And I only had one hour rather than three days. Uh, I'm not Fidel Castro. Um, um, look, I, 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 if, with all due respect, we did discuss this the other night. I think you're being extraordinarily patronizing to poor people. Um, poor people need growth. Sorry, they need growth, because it's, I mean, I, I just don't believe in the kind of no growth scenarios. They need growth. Why do they need growth? Because only through growth do you, do you live more than to the age of 30. Uh, growth will give you sewers. <laughs> growth will give you better food. It will give you better nutrition. Growth will give you better education. You can't build great universities like this in poor countries. You know, and on and on and on. I mean, so if I might be blunt about it, because you've been pretty blunt to me, so I'll be blunt back. It's a middle class pretense frankly, to take that line. And, you know, we, and this, this is the dilemma we face, that the poor peoples of the world who have been poor for hundreds of years are no longer content to remain poor, and this is what is good about the changing world we are living in. These are not just opportunities for our businesses. This is real change in the human potential of millions of people in India, in China, in Indonesia, and Brazil. And that's going to come only with growth. We then will have to deal with some of the ecological consequences of that. We will have to address those questions, no doubt about it. But I actually don't think, along with Nick Stern, that there is a necessary conflict between growth and getting your ecological is issues right as well. We can surely, on the basis of material abundance and good policies and global cooperation, get that right. But we're not going to get it right on the basis of remaining poor. Growth is the future. Growth is the only thing which actually will change the world and improve the world for the better. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you very much. It just remains for me to make three brief sets of thanks. Um, firstly, to the University of Melbourne, to the new Melbourne School of Government for sponsoring this event, to the London School of Economics. Uh, and we hope, as Simon said earlier, that this will just be the first of a series of events, both here and in London. Secondly, to all of you, uh, at least those of you who've stayed right to the end, which is uh, most of you, which is a sign of the quality of the lecture. Um, and particularly, perhaps, to the London School of Economics uh, alumni uh, who came along yeah. tonight, uh, who deserve a special welcome. Uh, and finally, uh, to Michael Cox, um, a good friend and colleague. It's very good to see him here. A controversial subject uh, in all sorts of ways, uh, but he did it in his, or delivered it in his usual stimulating uh, and interesting fashion. Um, and I'd like you all to join with me in the traditional thanks.